So I'm here to uh, present uh, some software that I've been working for as part of a, a different project that I'm working on uh, with silencing. Um, so they have to do with mobile forensics. Uh, has any one of you done any mobile forensics? Right. So um, I would like to apologize because I'm a little slow at the start of every talk. So uh, it might take a few moments to uh, pick it up. So what we're going to talk today is so just more or less what are mobile forensics, what are the constraints that everyone has, that has done mobile forensics uh, has come across. Um, some common grounds in different devices, different operating systems um, that you have when we're doing the forensics. And how could we go by achieving some form of automation on, the, uh, on this uh, in various forensic uh, scenarios and operating systems. Uh, we're going to have a demo on a piece of software uh, that we've been working on uh, that tries and attempts to do this automation for you. It's not finished yet, uh, but hopefully by the end of this month we'll have uh, an open source release of that tool. Uh, we will also see some other software that I've developed, uh, the uh, Asyncor acquisition uh, software and a memory uh, process damper, which all of them are going to be part of the final release of the software. Uh, these ones uh, should be released by the end of this uh, next week. All right, so more or less, mobile forensics, you're doing forensics, but in mobile devices. Um, you have different operating systems, so basically what the scope includes is mobile devices themselves, the systems uh, that they've interacted with, and mainly uh, systems that uh, acquire the backups for those devices, um, communicate with these, those devices, and so on. And any other peripheral devices, such as removable storage, uh, SIM cards, um, and anything else that connects to the device. So when we refer to these things in these talks, that's what we're referring to. So, uh, Nowadays, mobile devices are smartphones, are full-blown operating systems themselves. They run on the ARM platform. Uh, they've got the Android one is a full-blown Linux system. You can do pretty much whatever you can do on a Linux system on them. Uh, the iOS, more or less, is a Unix-like system. If you dig deep enough, <coughs> deep enough. Um, so they're easily programmable through a number of interfaces, um, the uh, frameworks that they provide. Um, they're built with the defense in mind, which makes it harder for you to do the forensic analysis. They have a bunch of uh, lockdowns, keys, encryption stuff, hardware and software encryption, uh, that makes it a bit more complex to acquire uh, the forensic artifacts that you want to uh, extract evidence from. Um, and so on. So, what are the issues with these mobile devices? What are, what are the issues with mobile forensics? The biggest issue is that this world, the smartphone world, constantly evolves from one year to the next. Uh, in a few, um, uh, in the next uh, few years that are going to come, we would see um, constant updates every couple of months new features, different ways of doing things, more applications, and so on. So in this kind of environment of constant change, it's very hard to maintain capability uh, when doing the forensics, the mobile forensics. If something changes constantly, it's hard to, do, to know that I have a fixed process of doing forensics on those devices. You've got some laws and regulations changing. Some of them are trying to force mobile devices to change the way that they're doing things. Um, we have corporate-driven changes. Uh, for example, there have been some uh, hiccups about the uh, hardware and software encryption that is being provided on most devices. 
So we have different operating systems, different file systems being used on the devices, different applications, different peripherals, and all these many things that make it hard for you to do the uh, forensic analysis. Then you have the constant updates and changes, like we said. So how can you achieve automation in this constantly changing environment? What you can do, one thing that you can do, you can have actually hard code everything. So based on the current state of the Android of an Android device or an iOS device, I would hard code all fixed locations that I can acquire information from. Um, that's most. That's what most um, commercial entities. Um, have been doing, but nowadays they're trying to change things and make them more generic. Uh, the problem with this is that every time something changes, you need to keep up with, with all changes. You need to write some more code. And in the end, you're going to end up with a huge application that more or less supports all the legacy stuff, but it's hard for you to keep up uh, with the new stuff. Um, so. If you're doing it yourself, you would have to sacrifice your personal life and then uh, live in agony whenever a new operating system update comes up or a different update for the application and so on. Um, so if you want to reduce the load in building something, a framework that could support these things, um, you need to find the common ground between uh, applications, between operating system systems, between how everything works on the device because to be honest uh, mobile devices it's the same thing over and over again just a few things changing on the top they all run on an ARM platform they all have some sort of a framework which is using common open source systems like SQLite or um, um, what's the name of it anyway um, open source systems basically uh, they all have more or less the applications, um, the cross-platform applications, for example, different applications that are built for those devices. They use more or less a fixed, um, they have a fixed structure and they use fixed, they have fixed features um, which are common between different versions. You can also plan for change, so you can accommodate change in this framework to make it easier to implement updates. So when something gets updated, when a new version of an application comes up and something changes, you have to be able, with little effort, effort to accommodate that change. So more or less, um, you have the lower level, like we said, that. Um, the hardware and the platform, which is ARM. On Android, uh, we have the XFS file system, the newer versions anyway. Um, the FAT for the SD cards. Um, we have the HFS X for the iOS system, which is the Apple's proprietary uh, file system. You've got the most common thing uh, is the database storage which is on both devices uh, using the SQLite databases. So this is one uh, common thing that they have which we can use um, to generalize the forensic acquisition process. You've got the configuration files on Android that are mainly in XML um, and in iOS more or less they're XML themselves, just a different format that can be converted to XML. And then you've got the applications on top that run on Java and native code on Android and on iOS Objective-C, which is more or less native code as well. So, like we said, we've got the SQLite databases. Uh, both these operating systems use a central storage unit to provide uh, information such as SMS, call logs, calendar, uh, tasks and so on. You've got the system configuration stored in that XML, most of them on XML files and some of them on, on key value files. Um, 
So we've got more common denominators between those these two operating systems that we thought than we thought. Um, and when you talk about cross-platform applications and frameworks that um, support these things, or for example, uh, Facebook, the Facebook application, or any other major application on these devices, they're exactly the same thing. Same architecture, same way they work, same databases. So we've got more common things on these devices than um, you can think of. So having that in mind, you can build some sort of a layered system that can do the extraction for you, that can automate the process between different techniques that you have on different devices and come up with the results on top. So for example, different file systems. So we can have something that understands the file system itself the file system structure, so which files in which folder, where I can find configuration files, or where I can find the storage for the device's SMS messages. The application parser that knows how to go in there and extract information from applications, both on iOS and on Android. You would know that, look, Facebook is using this database file in this path on Android and in this path on iOS to store <laughs> information, for example, uh, chat messages. And it has the same exact structure, the same tables, uh, same contents, same schema of the database. Maybe the names might change, but more or less the schema remains the same. Uh, configuration. So this is the most uh, volatile piece that you can find on mobile devices. And it's completely different between different operating systems. But still, you can have one layer at that specific point that says, look, uh, if I want to see which devices, uh, which Bluetooth devices these devices are associated with, both of the operating systems have that configuration file. So the information is the same. I want to see the app devices. I want to see Wi-Fi connected networks. So the information is the same, it's just the files below it that change. So if you know where to find the files, you can parse the entire thing into a higher level and make it understandable and put it in a catalog. So the catalog on top would contain this information, it would categorize information, network information, application information, um, what else do we have? Um, configurations of the device, and so on. And based on that, and based on the rules that you might specify in these different layers, you can come at the end, after you do all the parsing, all the translations, and everything else, and you can build a timeline, which would make your life with forensic analysis on mobile devices much, much, much more easier. So, more or less, the system that we are building has this architecture. So we have, at the moment, we're accommodating Android and iOS. Uh, mostly Android, uh, but iOS is coming up uh, soon. So what we have there? We have the lower level layers that can handle the file system of devices. They can do the device extraction themselves and automation possibly in the future about doing the extraction, the uh, logical and physical memory, physical dumps of the file system. Um, they can go, they can dig into that file system and say, look, this is the location where applications are stored. This is the location where the uh, wireless configuration settings are, are stored. You also have the backup parser and extractors that you can pull the backups from the devices and start doing the analysis on top with slightly different settings. Then, on top of that, you have the application and configuration parsers. The application parser purely knows how each application works and how it can parse it, what known entries I have for this specific application, for example, Facebook, WhatsApp, the Android browser, the Safari browser on iOS, 
so on, um, and the configuration parcel that understands where the operating system has all the configuration settings and such. And on top of that, you have the catalog. The catalog is just the generic way of presenting information. So I have information about the device, uh, IMEI or uh, uh, the, uh, for example, the uh, MAC address of the Wi-Fi interface or the Bluetooth interface and so on. You've got some settings of the device, um, the applications which get passed from here and there, networking information that it might have, and so on. So how can you accommodate change in this specific architecture? It's simple. You build modules. You have a module for that application, a module for a different application. You have a module for the configuration settings of Android. You stick a little version on them as well, so when the version changes, you know that that thing might have changed. I've got a newer module for that specific thing. Um, so you can define the location of the configuration files. Uh, you can define which catalog that specific thing goes into. Uh, you can define the paths to known fields. For example, I have an XML file that contains information that I want to pull out of that device. So I'm saying, this XML file, at that specific path, contains in this X path, in this XML path, that information, which is, let's say, a string, which contains the MAC address of the wireless interface, or it contains uh, that why the Wi-Fi networks that this device was connected to. Then you've got the applications, same thing. Applications <coughs> have what? They have files, random images, data files, and databases. So you know, for example, that the WhatsApp application has a database in there that's called uh, if I'm not mistaken, main.db, which is an SQLite 3 database, which has these tables, and in that specific table, I have a field called date, which I have to translate into, let's say, a Unix timestamp, because it's different. And then that table has the messages that were sent from, that were exchanged using this application, and then from there, go up the layers, we extract that information, and we have it in a meaningful way. Um, right, so an example of these configuration files. This is an example. So we've built the application in such a way that it could accommodate custom configurations, changes, and ways to define what you need. And in this example here is the Chrome Android browser application. What the higher level staff do, they can identify that that specific application, uh, sorry, they can identify the location of that specific application. And from that point, they go into this configuration file here, and they say, look, which are the known files that I have? 
and for example, it's a browser two dot db file. So when I pass, when I when I reach the point where I pass this file, what I'm doing is I'm looking up this configuration, and in here it says I have a known table called history. So there's a table in this file called history, which has a field named date, uh, which is in um, uh, it's in uh, WebKit timestamp, which I would have to convert into a Unix timestamp. So it, it accommodates changing stuff on uh, each field. And then from there, I'm just saying, I'm just telling the program that if you're gonna, going to parse this field, parse it as a date. So I know that in that database, in that application, uh, in, in that table, I have a field that is a date field. And from there, we can build up and come up with a timeline because we already know there is a date field there. Um, so we'll release how these things are, uh, you can build these rules. Um, it's quite simple actually, uh, but hopefully we think that we've uh, put in anything, everything that we need to make these definitions accurate. Right, so if you don't have these fields, if we come across an unknown application, it still works. So it still automatically parses the databases and the configuration files, but it doesn't know that that specific field is a date. So you cannot do the uh, timeline generation if it doesn't know that that piece of information is a date. But it can extract the database and you can view it yourself. And hopefully, uh, when we release it, we're going to have a nice right click button that you can do it, then you can say, this is a date, for example, and it would add it automatically. Um, right, so you can also specify uh, SQL commands that can get executed, so you can parse the table in a better format. So the idea is that for each application, you just write small pieces of information that you want to parse and add them, just drop the file inside the uh, Android apps folder and it automatically adds it and parses it uh, itself. And for the configuration files, for example, uh, so we've got a configuration file named uh, wpasupplicant.conf on an Android device, which contains information about the usage of uh, uh, Wi-Fi networks. In this case, the directory of this file is uh, misc Wi-Fi and then the user data partition, which we're not gonna get into at the moment. And in there, what we can do, we can specify regular, so this is, uh, this is a regular expression configuration file. So you write your rules to parse the file in a regex uh, format, which is like that. Yes. So what it's saying here is that, uh, so this is a catalog networking file, that's a title, uh, known files, connected networks here, and have a, have a container in there, so network, uh, let me open the file and show you. warn you, this is a dump that I've made from my own device a few hours ago, so uh, hopefully nothing weird is in there. <laughs> um, 
So this is a configuration file. So when I said I had a container, uh, it's this one, this thing here. So basically this thing here, so you've got many of these entries that specify the networks that I've, in, I've connected to. Uh, this is as much of this information I can pull from there. Um, there are all the networks that I've connected to here. They are all in Cyprus, so you won't find them in the UK. Uh, yes? Yeah, anyway, so that's not reveal more information. Um, right, so this is the, this is the file that um, this is the module for that specific file. And in here I'm saying that I have a container in there that uh, has specific values. And I'm saying that the SSID equals and the value in there is the network's name, then the access point address, then the security type, then the password, then the priority. Those things get parsed. So I just copy the file inside uh, a folder, this file, and it gets parsed automatically. So it extracts that information, the information that you define. And same goes for any other kind of files in this directory. So this is partially, I haven't completed it yet, the entire um, configuration file on how to extract Wi-Fi information from Android devices. Um, in another example with the Bluetooth information, uh, which is an XML file. Which contains information about the local adapter uh, and any devices that are connected. And it also contains any keys or any pins that I've used to associate, to pair with those devices. So, so this is the XML file, and this is the configuration on how to parse that XML file, which is basically an XPath um, string, which tells the application how to find that specific entry, pull the information, and in that entry, I have, for example, the device hardware address, and so on. So these are the configuration files that are relatively easy to write. So these are the modules to the application. They are relatively easy to write, so you don't have to rewrite the entire thing all over again. So all you have to do when something new comes up, you just change the version on top, um, and then put in the changes and the application will automatically parse it for you. Now, we've talked about timeline generation. Uh, to save you the hassle, it's not done yet. But uh, the idea on how to do it is, we designed it, what we have to do is some more extra coding, and it will, it will be done. But more or less, it bases itself on those modules, on the modules that we write to configure how we parse information. So based on that, we have those definitions, we know where everything is, and um, based on we have, for example, we're building a timeline, so we know we need the date fields. So based on we know where all the date fields are, and maybe, so we have the categories of the files or of the information, this is Bluetooth, this is Wi-Fi, this is something else, this is SMS. We can also uh, maybe in some other version accommodate like icons and colors for different things. Uh, we can take all that information, put it in a big pile, do some analytics on top of them and come up with something like this. So a timeline of events of that specific mobile device. Uh, this example here, for example, you've got a, an incoming call, contacts name, duration of the call, date and time, and then uh, the contacts2.db file was modified because it maintains this information in there. Uh, and then you have, for example, an incoming SMS and the message, 
uh, modification of the SMSS file, then access on a website. So we build a timeline so we can extract what happened in this uh, scenario, in this uh, incident. So what do we have so far? The idea is to come up with something. With something that works on this, on a Raspberry Pi. And on top of this, we can also put a, a touch screen. So put it together. Have a nice plastic bundle on top of those and then you can take these devices uh, go uh, where the incident take place so you'll, doing, you'll be doing um, so, so uh, basically uh, you, will, you won't even have to take more or less the device back uh, to the office or in your lab you take this, you go there, you plug in the phone uh, you touch something on the website that I'm just going to show you and you extract all the information, store it on a USB or something uh, and go back to the lab, hook this up on the network and then access and view the information, parse it and so on. Uh, I was going to do a demo on this but I didn't have time to set it up so all I can do is show you the device more or less. Uh, and with that you can have any extra things like a SIM card reader you can plug it in and do extra to extract extra information. Oh. So this is the, uh, the uh, application that we are building. So uh, this application is running uh, on Python uh, on a framework called Cherry Pi. So the idea is, is to have a Raspberry Pi running on a Cherry <coughs> Pi then running this application which we don't know what we call it yet, we might go for a B. So the B on a, the B on a Cherry on a Pi, more or less. <laughs> so you can do with this, it's, uh, so the idea you have, so it does allow you to view it in smaller screens as well. So it's a yeah, bootstrap framework. Uh, so you can do the device extraction, the SIM card extraction, and then from there you can go and you can create the cases. So let's create a dummy case, assign Rombokrog as the officer, uh, logical bugger. So the thing is, if we do the device extraction, we wouldn't have to do these things, these parts here. For, for this demo, what I'm going to do, I've mounted the logical image of the, the user's data partition where everything is stored uh, under slash mount slash data. So we're going to do the, just the application extraction. Uh, so I'm specifying to this application, look, I have uh, the, uh, the user's partition mounted in that location and go and do me an analysis on that specific uh, folder. So from there, click O, place, it starts parsing the information that we have. Uh, like I said, this is from my device, so, uh, right. So, it's finished. So we get, we get the interface here. Uh, device info, so this is your catalog more or less that got extracted. Uh, for now, we just have the apps more or less working at the moment. So we have the applications that have been installed, uh, the date that they were uh, installed. Uh, this is in red because it doesn't use the information stored on the device to determine the date, which is uses metadata of the folder to extract the information, but if you 
specify it. Um, so basically, in the final release, it would just read the configuration file of the device and tell you this application was installed at that time. Um, so the browser. So if we go into the application, what it does, it lists all of the files and folders of the application. This is done automatically. Uh, the uh, modules, like we said, are supplementary information that we have about this application. Uh, if we click on a file, it would tell us, it would give us the signature, the type of the file, size, uh, MAC times, user ID, mode, and so on. From there, you can go on and you can do the, let's say, view the file, parse it and view it, uh, do a hex stamp, extract the strings of the file, and so on. So these are down here as well, or if you can't bother, you just, just can't go and click that, and it will parse it for you. So we just clicked on the webview.db, which, which we weren't supposed to do that. We want to view the browser2.db. Now, uh, in here, we can view the bookmarks of the device. Uh, we've got the dates down there, which we could, we could parse. We, we could specify and tell, uh, create a module or uh, add to this application's module and say that, look, the um, um, browser2.db table bookmarks field created is uh, <coughs> a timestamp, so parse that one. We've got the history, and this was supposed to be parsed automatically, but I did some code changes. So the function should be date. But it gets the uh, year wrong for some reason. So you would so if you build the configuration, the module for this application, it would also automatically print you the date, so translate it into a date and build it for you. Uh, the nice thing about this, it also parses the images stored in the database, so you can go through them. We would need to fix the yeah. interface a little bit. So you put, for example, the uh, uh, temporary files generated by SQLite, um, the right ahead log, for example, uh, which uh, you cannot parse it. There are ways to parse it anyway, but what you could do, if you click on view, it would do the hex stamp of the application and you can go through it, maybe extract some information, or you could also go and do extract strings and view through the strings and see what's in there as well. The same goes for every file on the device, so you can do that. If the application recognizes the format, it would parse it itself, so it recognizes those uh, uh, PHP files, the database files, XML files, so it can make it, can parse them for you and you can view them nicely. Uh, so this is the um, music player I have installed. Service.xml, it's an XML file. So when I click view, you can view the contents of the file. So even without the modules, you can still do some analysis at this specific point of the application. Um. Right, so the next application uh, is an application for SIM card forensics. The, um, the reason behind building uh, 
this application more or less was because I bought this device, it's a pretty cheap device, about uh, two pounds. Um, it's a SIM card reader, and supposedly uh, it should work when pulling backups or pulling some forensic information from SIM cards. I've tried uh, almost all the applications I could get my hands on this, uh, on, on my hands that can do SIM card forensics, and none of them worked. Now maybe I was doing something wrong, but okay, a couple of them worked, but I didn't like the way they were doing things. Uh, and I'm also pretty cheap, and I didn't want to buy more expensive, more expensive devices to do the extraction. So, um, with that in mind, basically, what I had to do, what we had to do, was uh, more or less understand how the SIM cards work. SIM cards or smart cards are essentially uh, full-blown devices. Uh, they're everywhere. Uh, uh, credit cards, train tickets, uh, almost everywhere. Uh, the ones used in, telecom in the telecommunication industry uh, run on uh, the Java card operating system, which is essentially Java a bit more stripped down and built for these specific things. So it's an operating, it's a, it's a whole computer system in a small device. Um, so in there, so they got the CPU, the RAM, uh, all the other stuff. You can communicate with them through a specific protocol and ask for information, ask them to execute stuff, to send you stuff, and so on. Uh, so when you're doing forensics on SIM cards, you want to extract some information. That information is stored on the SIM card's file system. The file system is structured more or less like any other file system. It's, uh, it has folders and files. Uh, folders are named dedicated files, and files are essentially named elementary files. Um, so I run through it. Uh, you can communicate with them using the APDU protocol over a serial connection. Uh, information in the SIM card that could be useful in forensic analysis, the ID number of the SIM card, the mobile subscriber number of the user, which can tell us the country, the network, and the actual subscriber identification number, uh, the telephone number uh, assigned to the SIM card, the last dial numbers and location information. So the last location of this SIM card in the mobile network. These are still there, except the SMSs that are stored on the devices nowadays. But uh, on every devices, you will see the LOTI, the LND, the last dial numbers, location information uh, being there. So, and also the IDs uh, of this SIM card. How you do that? Okay, let's just go through this. Uh, specific one. So when you connect to the SIM card, what you do, you communicate, you initiate a connection with the SIM card, with the smart card. And then you say, you issue a command, uh, specific bytes, different commands, different uh, with bytes and so on, and you say that I want to select, for example, go into this directory, which is the master, master dedicated file, so it's the root directory, uh, having said this, files don't have names, they just have IDs on a SIM card. So the ID of the root directory is this, and then when I want to read a file, I just tell the SIM card, give me the contents of file 2FE2. You can look up all these things in the uh, ETSI standards, the European Telecommunication Standards Authority. Uh, they, it's a bit sketchy, but you can extract the information <coughs> from there, given that you understand the way they write things. So you can experiment, find them out. Uh, 